Okay, guys, this is part two of the um, ACR nursing exam video set um, set. And in this part of the video series, we are going to go over quiz questions that are actual quiz questions and break them down so that we can really fine tune our exam taking skills and so that you can look at these nursing school questions in a different way than you've been looking at them before. And really, this is all about test taking strategies that will make taking tests from this point on much easier for you. Okay, so let's just start. If you're new to this channel, hello, my name is Jamie. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also a nursing professor. And I have been asked many times by my students to help them um, break down quiz questions. And I did this exact PowerPoint and the video that was before this one called um, Ace Your Nursing School Exams. I'll link it right here. Interestingly, right after we did this class, my students had a test in farm. And right after they took this and went and took their test in pharmacology, they said this helped them so much. And so I'm hoping that it can help lots of you because nursing school exams are no joke and I want you to be successful. So here we go. Let's jump into it. Okay, so how we're gonna do this is we're gonna look at this question. Now you can look at this too, but what name is given to the rhythmic biological clock that exists in humans? So I'll give you a second to look that over. The choices are the sleep-wake cycle, alert unaware process, circadian rhythm, and the yo-yo theory. So this is an example of Bloom's taxonomy and the remembering level. So if you know this, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't know it. And what is it, guys? It is a circadian rhythm. But as we move on, we're going to see a little bit more challenging questions. A nurse working the night shift assesses a client's vital signs at 4 a.m. What would be the expected findings based on the knowledge of non-rapid eye movement sleep. So this is an example of understanding and applying. So we have to understand the different phases of non-rapid eye movement sleep and what is going on with them. We know from knowing about the sleep cycle and even just our own personal experiences that we quiet down when we are sleeping, things slow down a little bit, and so we can get rid of no change from daytime vital signs because of course it's going to be different. We're in sleep now. We are going to slow down a bit. We can get rid of increased temp, increased pulse, respiratory, and blood pressure. So then now we're left between decreased temp, pulse, respiratory rate, and blood pressure and highly individualized depends on many factors. But this question is asking us, what would the expected findings be based on the knowledge of non-rapid eye movement sleep? And we know that it's a decrease in temp, pulse, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. So we may need to guess between these two if we didn't know, but we're going to choose A because it's answering the question that is being asked. Okay, next question. The patient is being seen for chest congestion, coughing up thick secretions and shortness of breath for several days and is diagnosed with pneumonia. The patient has a two pack per day smoking habit. When developing the plan of care, what would be a priority nursing diagnosis for this patient? Okay, guys, read over these answers. I'll read them for you in case you're driving or folding laundry. So A, ineffective airway clearance related to tracheobronchial secretions as evidenced by expectorating thick yellow secretions. B, ineffective health maintenance as evidenced by smoking and unhealthy dietary habits. C, ineffective breathing pattern related to patient report of shortness of breath. D, ineffective therapeutic regimen management due to smoking. Okay, so this has the word priority in it. So we have to pick the priority. A, ineffective airway clearance related to tracheal bronchial secretions as evidenced by expir expectorating thick yellow secretions. Now, since this question has the word priority in it, we had to pick airway as our priority. 
are the other B, C, and D appropriate answers for this patient eventually? Yes, they are. But A is the priority, and that is what we would go with. Okay, next question. A nurse is reviewing the health history and physical assessment findings for a patient who is having respiratory problems. The patient has a history of a CBA, bipolar disorder, and diabetes. Which patient statement from the health history would be a cue for this problem? Okay, so what's this problem? Respiratory problems. That's why they are in the hospital. Okay, so A, I often have diarrhea after eating spicy foods. B, my skin is so dry, I just can't keep from scratching. C, I get out of breath when I walk a few steps. D, I just feel so bad about myself these days. Okay, tricky question. If you overthink in this question, you could get it wrong, but the nurse is reviewing a health history and physical assessment findings for a patient who is having respiratory problems. So it is C, I get out of breath when I walk a few steps because the question is asking, about respiratory problems. The nurse is providing care for a patient who experienced an ischemic stroke five days ago. The patient now has difficulty swallowing liquids and solid foods, has weakness on the right side of the body, and is incontinent of bowel and bladder. Which priority nursing diagnosis should the nurse identify and document in the care of this patient? Select all that apply. Okay, so this is a really good example of a question where you could read into this patient's diagnosis, but we're just going to look at what the question is telling us and answer it based on that. So our patient has bowel incontinence, right? It says right here in the question. Our patient has impaired swallowing. It says right here in the question. Our patient has impaired physical mobility. It says it right here, weakness on the right side of the body. So there we go. If we read into it, we might want to pick despair, or we might even be able to really overthink it and be like, well, maybe they have difficulty breathing because they're swallowing liquids and they've aspirated. But that's not in the question. Don't overthink the question. Next question. Upon auscultation of a patient's heart rate, the nurse notes the rate to have an irregular pattern of 72 beats per minute. The nurse notifies the healthcare provider because the patient is exhibiting signs of A, a dysrhythmia, B, tachycardia, C, bradycardia, and D, hypertension. This is a good example of remembering or maybe even understanding, but 72 beats per minute. What is a person's heart rate's normal range? You got to know that. So it's 60 to 100. So it's within that. So we're not tachycardia. We're not bradycardia. This has nothing to do with blood pressure. So even if we didn't know the answer 100%, it's A, a dysrhythmia because of the irregular pattern. Next question. A patient 86 years of age with a diagnosis of dementia and cardiomyopathy is exhibiting signs and symptoms of heart failure. During the AM vitals, the nurse has attempted to assess the patient's temperature using an oral thermometer, but the patient is unable to follow directions to close the mouth and secure the thermometer sublingually. Additionally, the patient repeatedly withdraws their head when the nurse attempts to use the tympanic thermometer. How should the nurse proceed with this assessment? Okay. So we really need to know what's going on with this patient. He's 86 years old. He has dementia, which means he's confused. He's being uncooperative and he is showing signs of heart failure. So we need to protect this patient. Let's look at the, ch the choices. A, assess the patient's temperature by axilla. B, assess the patient's skin tone and the presence or absence of sweating to determine whether the, what, whether the patient's temp. I don't know, that's a typo there, but use a disposable mercury thermometer to take the patient's temperature and D, take the patient's temperature rectally. Okay, well, we can get rid of B and C for sure because we aren't going to just check the patient's skin tone and presence of sweat. 
We aren't going to use a mercury thermometer because that would hurt our patient. If it broke, we don't even use those anymore. So would we do it rectally or axillary? Well, again, this is heart failure. We're not terribly concerned about an infection. It would be a check the patient's temperature by axilla. Okay, next question. When assessing the patient's vital signs, a nursing student has explained to the patient each of their next actions prior to assessing the patient's temperature, pulse, and blood pressure. However, the nursing student did not announce their intention to assess the patient's respiratory rate prior to measuring it. What is the rationale for the nursing student's decision to withhold this information? So in this question, we need to know why the student has decided not to tell the patient they are checking the respiratory rate. And in that, we need to understand why the student isn't telling the patient this information. So A, the patient may alter the rate of respirations if the patient is aware his breaths are being counted. B, the nurse likely assess the patient's respiratory rate simultaneously when counting the heart rate. C, temperature, pulse, and blood pressure are more volatile than respiratory rate. D, tachypnea is expected finding amongst hospitalized individuals. So the answer is A, the, oops, the patient may alter the rate of respirations if his breasts are being counted. So we know this from our assessment skills and vital signs lab. And also, but if we didn't know this, is the nurse likely to assess the patient's respiratory rate simultaneously while counting the heart rate? No, that would take some serious talent. Are the temperature pulse blood pressure more volatile than a respiratory rate? No, and is tachypnea an expected finding? No. So we can definitely rely on A to be our correct answer. Okay, which pathological condition would result in the release of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, by the posterior pituitary? So for this question, you need to know what exactly is antidiuretic hormone. So our choices are A, hemorrhage, B, allergies, C, obesity, and D, asthma. If we understand what antidiuretic hormone is, then we can choose from these choices with confidence. And an antidiuretic hormone regulates how much fluid we are going to withhold or diurese. And so if the release of antidiuretic hormone is happening, it is because we are becoming fluid volume deficit and we're trying to not diurese. So we're trying to hold on to fluid. So hemorrhage would be our answer. Okay, a nurse is assessing a patient who has a fever, has an infection of a flank incision and is in severe pain. What type of pulse rate would the patient most likely exhibit? So most likely, because if you really read into this, you could go down all kinds of different paths, but we need to understand what type of heart rate are we going to have if we have an infection and we're in pain? Are we going to have bradycardia? Are we going to have tachycardia? Are we going to have a dysrhythmia? Or are we going to have bigeminal? Or bigeminy? Bigeminal is what it says here on the slide. So bradycardia is a slow heart rate under 60 beats per minute. Are we going to have that with an, in an infection? No. Tachycardia, that's above 100. That's what we're going to see if we have pain and an incision. We can get rid of C and D very easily because we're not most likely going to see a dysrhythmia or bigeminy, tachycardia. Okay, a nurse is taking a patient's temperature and wants the most accurate measure based on core body temperature. What site should be used? So this is a remembering question, and we are going to go with rectal because rectal is the core body temperature and the most accurate measurement. Oral, axillary, and forehead give us a general temperature, but it is not a core body temperature. A hospital unit has a policy that rectal temperatures may not be taken on patients who have had cardiac surgery. What rationale supports this policy? So A, it is an embarrassing and painful assessment. B, the thermometer insertion stimulates the vagus nerve. C, it is less expensive to take an oral temperature. D, it is to avoid perforating the wall of the rectum. Okay, so let's go through these questions. 
It's B, a thermometer inserts and stimulates the vagus nerve. We know that if we have to do a fecal impaction, we have to be careful of stimulating that vagus nerve as well. Would we rule out rectal thermometers on a patient who's had cardiac surgery simply because it's embarrassing? No. Is it less expensive to take a rectal temperature than an oral? No, it costs the same. And it's to avoid perforating the wall of the rectum. Um, why would that just apply to cardiac surgery patients? So no, we can rule out all of those and it's B. A patient presents to the emergency department with profuse bleeding from a crushing injury while at work. Which set of vital signs does the nurse anticipate finding in such a patient? Oh, there's a weird typo there. Which set of vital signs does the nurse anticipate finding in this patient? So get rid of that word such. Um, so then we have to know what normal vital signs are, and we also need to know what would profuse bleeding do to our vital signs. So let's go through that really quick. If we're profusely bleeding, we're losing blood, which means we're not perfusing our organs and tissues properly. So our vital signs are going to change significantly. Our heart rate is going to go up. Our blood pressure is going to go down. Okay, so blood pressure 130 over 80, heart rate 74, respiratory rate 14. No, those are fine. Blood pressure 80 over 50 with a heart rate of 120 and a respiratory rate of 24. Well, if we know our vital signs and the normal range, we know all of these are off and all of these are showing distress from not being adequately perfused. So we can safely go with B. Okay, I hope that those questions helped you guys. Let me know how you do on your next exam and best of luck to you. I will see you in the next video.